when I stop the serotonin chasing and the cortisol creating, the doomsday scrolling and the dopamine searching, and I look deep into my own need. I feel like a shattered beer glass scattered on the floor as diners pass in a deserted bar, sharp and chaotic, split and serrated, displaced and uneven, a brash misjudgment, an angered overshot, the aftermath of an ugly scene. Like all the vices that I uncovered, the defense mechanisms I discovered, the pain and the trauma that I shamefully covered. When I stop all of the deceiving, the prideful self-relying, the selfish striving, the manipulation of others, and I look deep into my own need, I feel like a broken mirror, antique, gold, and stern on the outside, but falling apart at the centre. Dismantled, wounded, more vulnerable than one could ever know revealing a distorted image. I scramble to repair the cracks, but the shards continue to split, like the relationships that I tried to put back together in my own strength far, far too late. Can anything alter my fate? Can anyone wipe clean my slate? I'm desperate to be made whole again. I'm desperate to be whole again. Please, Lord, may there be more to life than this. Please stand with us this morning as we gather. All these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free amazing grace how sweet the
Lord Jesus, this morning as we gather, help us to see more fully the sacrifice you've made, the amazing grace that you give. Lord, may that sound be sweet to us and may our offering of worship be something sweet unto you also. Martin Luther King said that every human life is a reflection of divinity. In the lead up to Easter, we've been looking at people like us. Individuals like you and me who've had encounters with Jesus throughout the Gospel of Luke. And this morning we consider for a moment what it is to be people like us universally, what it is to be human. And from the very first pages of Scripture, we see the beauty of what it is to be people like us, that God in his love and his grace chose to create us. That God and his love and his grace chose to create us in his image and to create us for a purpose. And from Genesis chapter 1, we see our story begins with God creating out of love. God is creative and generative, intimate and relational and present with his people. And in Genesis chapter 1, at verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And here this concept of being created in God's image is not limited to a particular race or gender or social class. This is speaking about the origins of all humanity, about people like us, you and me. And this tells me that regardless of your background or your life circumstances, you, you are loved. And there is a reason that you were made. And therefore, when I look at you, I see something of God. I see the fingerprints and creative imagination of God. I see in you a reflection of God in this world. 
And you are to reflect God's image like a mirror reflects your own physical image. You are to reflect his likeness and life and light like the moon reflects the sun. Jesus is described in John chapter 1 as, in terms of light, as the light of the world that overcomes darkness. And Jesus refers to himself as the light of the world. Yet, in Matthew chapter 5, at verse 14, Jesus himself says, You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. The very source of light and life itself calls you the light of the world. And this is a purpose that is embedded in our very being as image bearers of God. We are to reflect him, to illuminate the world with the goodness of God and his good news. Jesus goes on to say in that passage, Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We are created in the image of God, created to image him, created to reflect his glory in this world. And in doing this, we find our sense of worth, value, and identity. Our vocation and calling is to mirror God in this world. And this means so much more than simply keeping rules or a ticket to heaven. We are given a sacred calling to be image bearers. And this calling, this innate purpose that we have is to fill the earth with God's image. That's why in Genesis, God tells humankind to multiply as his image bearers. That's why Jesus says to put the lamp on the stand to illuminate the whole house. We have this sacred calling to be image bearers to worship our creator and reflect our creator's wise rule back into this world. And this rain, it looks like Jesus. The image that we are to bear, it looks like Jesus. It looks like love. It looks like creativity. It looks like justice and peace, joy and intimacy, and a whole lot more. And as his image bearers, this is who we are designed to be. Every human life is a reflection of divinity. But every act of injustice mars and defaces the image of God in man. When I look around, I see beauty. I see beauty in humanity. I see God's image. I see God's order and his kingdom. But I also see brokenness. When I turn on the evening news, I see a broken world. I see injustice. I see inequity. I see greed. I see the abuse of power. This is a distortion of God's image. When I look at the church... I see the beautiful bride of Christ growing his kingdom. I see lives being transformed and renewed. I see healing and compassion. But I also see brokenness. I see tribalism and disunity. I see hurt and trauma. I see legalism, rules and judgment. And this is a distorted reflection of God's image. And when I take a look at myself as if in a mirror, I see not only a man with a receding hairline and a graying beard, but I see someone who is reflecting some of the goodness of God. I see someone that is loved and called, someone who is gifted and loyal. But if I take an honest look at the depths of my heart, I see selfishness. 
I see a desire to please people. I see a striving to succeed. I see greed. I see impatience. This is a distorted image of God. C.S. Lewis describes life in this world like this. I have lived my life among shadows and broken images. What was meant to be the reflection of God's very image is like a cracked mirror. I can see the goodness of God. I can see parts of what he has made you and me to be, but it's broken and bits are missing or concealed. And in many ways, people like us, we are broken. Our image and worth is distorted by things that have happened to us as the sharp edges of other broken people have inflicted wounds and as our own actions and omissions have distorted God's image in us. Our image is distorted by our egos and our self-made masks. And this broken condition is something that we all share. It is people like us who fail to reflect God's image in all its fullness. In Romans chapter 3, it says, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. And it seems our human nature to try and fix this problem. We cover the cracks. We try to put the pieces back together. We present an image, a facade that looks like we have it all together. I scramble to repair the cracks, but the shards continue to split, like the relationships that I've tried to stick back together in my own strength far, far too late. And in our own strength, it is too late. So this Good Friday, I encourage you to remember that we aren't the ones who need to do the fixing. In fact, if we want to restore God's image in us, there is only one who can do that. That is God himself. So I invite you to stand as we sing. And if there is a sense of hurt or woundedness or brokenness, to bring that to Jesus now, to offer that to him, that he might bring forgiveness and healing and wholeness as you allow him in his grace to gently put the broken pieces back and to restore the goodness of the beauty of his image in us. so much. Help us to see that now. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and strength them for joy. From the ashes, you 
Jesus is calling. Oh, come. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Let's lift our voices toward our Saviour. How wonderful. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing alleluia, Christ is risen. We bow down, bow down before. As you wait for the crown And tell the world of the treasure you found Amen I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Watch and pray, find in me thy holy Lord. Jesus, Jesus take it all, all to him my own. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
Please take your seats again. Can anyone alter my fate? Can anyone wipe clean my slate? Yes. The answer is yes. There is one who can. And in Romans, Paul asks a similar question. He says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? The answer, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can anyone alter my fate? Can anyone wipe clean my slate? Yes, Jesus, who is the perfect image, can redeem and restore. He is the radiance of God's glory, the exact imprint of his nature. He holds up the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for his sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He who created you in his own image wants to restore that image in you. He desires to pick up the broken pieces in a beautiful mosaic of mercy. And he has not changed. 
He has not changed. And the very same love and creativity and grace that God displayed in making you in his image is powerfully at work to remake you in his image. The very same love, creativity, and grace of God that's displayed in making you in his image is powerfully at work to remake you in his image. Paul puts it like this in Colossians chapter 3. He says, We have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. This is the beauty of the good news of Good Friday, that Jesus meets us in our brokenness, that he joined us in our humanity, that he experienced the pain, suffering, injustice and heartbreak of our broken world. He humbled himself, even to the point of death. And he did it for people like us, for you and for me. He did it in order to alter my fate. He did it in order to wipe clean my slate. And I love that Jesus does this in our brokenness. We can't seem to fix ourselves, our distorted image. Yet it is in our weakness and our brokenness that he chooses a kairos moment and graciously makes a way. When we can't fix our sin or mistakes, our brokenness, our wrongdoings or our omissions, when we can't restore our distorted picture of God, ourselves, when we can't put the pieces back together, Jesus comes. When we can't earn our way back to relationship with God, in Jesus, God comes to us. And he brings his rule and reign to bear even amidst our brokenness. You see, if Jesus is king of all, he is still king in our brokenness. In Romans chapter 5, it says, For while we were still weak, At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In a world where people like us are broken, there is one human who perfectly reflects the image of God, Jesus. And that very reflection of God's nature and character is revealed in his relentless and selfless love that would take him to the cross. There is one, Jesus, whose love is so great that he would die for people like us. And to correct this distorted image, we need to look to Jesus. And as I look to him on the cross, broken in my place, broken for my sake, I see the perfect image of God. I see a God who would stop at nothing for people like us. I see a God who in his love and his grace would make a way for us. I see the fullness of God in one Kairos moment on the cross that would restore people like us and change the history of humanity forever. In Jesus, I see God. Isaiah prophesied of the Messiah that he was pierced for our transgressions, He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. In a moment, we will come to the Lord's table and remember his body broken that we might be made whole. And as you come this morning, you would have received a piece of broken glass. This is to signify the broken part in you. And as we come to communion, I encourage you to leave your brokenness 
with Jesus and to exchange it for the bread which represents his body broken for you and the juice that represents his blood spilled for you. It is the great exchange, his righteousness for your sins, his wounds for your healing, his death for your life. And for you, this bit of broken glass might represent sin that you need to confess and leave behind this morning. It might be a distorted picture of your worth as a child of God. It might be a distorted picture of your ego. It might be a distorted picture of God or religion. It might be wounds from trauma or broken relationships that you need to bring to Jesus and ask for healing. Whatever your brokenness, this is an opportunity to leave it with God and to trust him to make a beautiful mosaic in his mercy. So I want to give you a moment now to ponder what you need to leave at the Lord's table this morning and entrust to him. There's a different meal that Jesus shared with his followers in John chapter 6. And after miraculously feeding 5,000 people, Jesus says to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. And let nothing be wasted. And I believe that as we bring our broken pieces this morning... Jesus will gather them and he will make something beautiful and nothing will be wasted. So when you're ready, come to the tables at the front or at the back here, here and here. Come authentically, knowing that you are loved and accepted, brokenness and all, and then take the bread and the juice back to your seat and in your own time when you're ready, partake in communion. Remembering that God demonstrated his love for you in this. While you were still weak, at just the right time, Christ died for you.
I take the bread of life, broken for all my sin, your body crucified to make me whole again. I will recall the cup poured out in sacrifice. To trade this sin event for your new covenant. Hallelujah. I live my life in remembrance. Hallelujah. Your promise I won't forget. Oh, salvation throne, we fear and tremble. Your way born as my own, as Christ is born to me. You are so, so, so good to us. God, we overflow with gratitude to say thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. Sing it again. You've been so, so good to me. You've been so, so good to me. And to think where I would be if not for you, if not for you. Oh, mm-hmm. 
Thank you. Please be, take a seat. Well, a belated good morning and welcome to you all in the room and to those who've joined us online as well. If you're visiting with us today, we would love to have the opportunity to say hello. So please uh, greet someone in the foyer and we'd love to connect with you. You can find out more about RBC by checking us out online or looking up the socials. And don't forget, Sundays are coming. Join us on Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection as well. This meal is all about, this service is all about, Easter is all about the generosity of God toward us. And how important it is for us to be generous towards others. So our offering today is dedicated entirely to sharing the good news of Easter with those in the world who are yet to hear, particularly in our local area. So if you're giving electronically, mark it as Good Friday. Uh, if you're giving in the boxes, that will be put towards that end. I want to pray now. And I want to pray for a couple of things. One is for the suffering in our world, the conflict and the brokenness, that God would meet people in those places. The other is youth from across our Baptist movement are on Easter camp, and it'd be great to pray for them, and many of our leaders and uh, youth are there as well. Join with me in prayer. Father, how wonderful it is that we should stand before you this morning in awe of your work of love and grace expressed indescribably, really, in the events of Easter. And Lord, we, uh, we recognize the brokenness of our world. We think of the conflict in Gaza, in the Ukraine, and in other places in Africa. Lord, we see it in the systems of our world, and we see it in our own lives. Thank you for entering that brokenness. And we pray that in those places of great suffering, people might find you. Discover your grace, your mercy, your peace, your comfort. And Lord, we thank you for the young people of our movement and of our church. We thank you that every life matters to you. So we pray for our young folk that are on camp this weekend. May this be a moment for them that is full of an encounter with you. And Father, as you have been generous to us, may we also be generous in return. May you bless our giving and may you use it wonderfully to enable us to share this good news with others. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. designed as perfect, designed to bear the very image of God himself, but distorted, distorted because we want to be the center of everything and in so doing displace God from his rightful place. And then wonderfully, inconceivably, Restored. Too good to be true, but it is. How will we respond? What is our response to this? great, generous love, this amazing sacrifice on our behalf. Well, we respond in devotion. We respond by giving our whole life to honour his life, his death. Jesus is all. He's all that matters. He is the centre of of all of history. The broken mirrors, the, 
the pieces that we've brought to the table. They remind us of broken jars in the Gospels. A woman, Mary, responds to Jesus with full devotion. And here is her story in the words of one Howard Serpy. So there is a woman. She's at home. It's almost getting dark, time to think about lighting the lamps, but she can't settle. She moves from one thing to the next. She doesn't know what to do with herself. She needs to find out where he is. But then what? She has a radical idea and she moves to the back of the house. From a hidden void in a wall, she pulls out a flask. Milky white alabaster marble, beautifully crafted. She holds it reverently in her hands, cradled in a cloth. Stuff it, she says, slips it into her bag and laughs. She's out the door now and into the night. It's not safe for a woman to be on the streets, even for her, though she knows it well but especially not when you've got $100,000 worth of rare perfume. Heaps to the shadows. The options for a woman alone without a husband are limited. You can beg, there's servitude, or the sex work. She chose the latter, and it has its consequences. For one thing, You can't do it forever. You get old and ugly. This was her nest egg, her superannuation. When she can, she buys a little bit more nard and pours it into the flask. But it doesn't seem to matter now. Only one thing matters. Finding him. She turns a corner. She thought so. It's a big house. Lights are on and there's a crowd. She makes herself small. She finds the shadows and slips in like a servant. The house is owned by Simon. (laughs) He's got his own issues. But he's done well. He's clawed his way up in the party. And this night is a little bit of a coup. He's thinking, we'll test this Jesus. Is he a fraud? Is he a charlatan? Or could he actually be useful? Suddenly in the house, there's a commotion. There's a woman there at his feet. Who is it? Simon knows her all too well. She's at his feet now, sobbing uncontrollably. Her hair is down. Well, it would be, wouldn't it? Disgraceful. And now she's pulling something out of her bag. It's like a huge egg. She cracks it on the pavers and the pieces scatter. Cascading over his feet, a brown puddle spreading over the floor. And then the scent hits like a wave. What? is that? Most people in the room, in the house, have never smelt it before. It's indescribable, complex, wonderful, beautiful. She's draped over his feet, still crying, and Jesus leans down, cradles her face, looks into her eyes, and then lets her cheek settle again on his feet. There is another version of this story. This time I'm roaming through the streets, looking for him with everything I own. Every aspect of my whole life in my bag. And I see him. And Jesus sees me and smiles. I fall at his feet, sobbing uncontrollably. 
and I crack my flask on the stones. And the whole of my life pours out over his feet. I smile. And I am his. Though people may misunderstand or even criticize devotion to Jesus, God will defend the impulse of extravagant worship. Jesus was worth it all. And Jesus is still worth it all. Paul writes in Philippians, he says, I consider everything loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Christ is all and no less. In him we have everything we need. And as we respond in worship together, the bridge of this song we're going to sing has these words. How I long to join the saints and live forever in devotion. Where the bottles that we've broken to the crowns we cast down. Whatever loss or gain, it's an honor and privilege that my life would be a witness to Jesus' name. Let's stand and sing together. So many times I fought for my reward Looking for mine before I give you yours You have always been, you will always be The center of all history So may my name
been on a bit of a journey this morning. We were created to be the image bearers of God, like mirrors reflecting Him, showing Him to the world. But our cracked and shattered images distort what we're supposed to reflect. But now through Jesus and the cross, we've been remade, the mirrors restored. While not perfect, they do once again reflect the image of God. And we respond with extravagant, unhindered devotion, giving our all to Him. We are the mirror, called to image and witness Jesus in the world. On Sunday, we'll hear more about this, so come and join us. But we'll also hear these lines from the poem. For the beauty of the good news is simply this. I am the mirror. You are the mirror. We are the mirror. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Forever. Amen. We're called to give our whole life. To give. We are to restored to reflect. So join with us as we celebrate our risen Saviour. Let's continue in worship. Just 
this day where we proclaim that through Jesus' death, there is new life for us. We are so expectant for Sunday. Please continue to be together as a body of believers before we leave, spreading and mirroring Christ within us among one another. God bless.